Yeah, that works. You can find that little Kalima. That's good to know. I'll share that. Yeah. Freaky, weird thing. Anything from Asia is just totally out of the, out of the, out. So I don't know. So I'm so, so thankful. folks we are so glad you were tuned in here at waters garden center the garden classes we're back into the thick of things so every saturday at 9 30 we have a free garden class and so today's class is on fruit trees just what you can grow how you can grow how you can get the most production out of them which varieties how to plant them and then i got a few other things if i get enough time you always over prepare for classes at least i do um, i've got all the fruit trees Get all the products, how to plant them. We'll go through all that. But then also, this is a unique time of year. You're seeing a shift. All the spring things are gone. So I don't have hardly any lilacs, no forsythia, no flowering quince. All the spring things gone. The summer things show up. So all the things that just love heat, you don't see these things in the spring and vice versa. So I brought a few of them that just are, are kind of this class um, is for the hardcore gardener. You want fruit trees. I mean, that's out of all the gardeners, you're really specialized and you want edible, sustainable, all that kind of stuff. We can help you with that. Uh, so these are some of the things that gardeners really like. And then we'll see if we can touch on how do you get more bees to pollinate your plants? And so we'll go over, we'll touch. So that's kind of the class format. Um, I've got three handouts for you. One is I wrote a book on local fruit trees. It's got all the fruit tree uh, pollination guides, how to plant it, all this entire class in, the, in a short book. There'll be a digital format to you, PDF, free to you. So I'll, I'll send that out to you. I've got a uh, um, how to grow blueberries, which kind of relates kind of stuff. So it just kind of blueberries are hard to grow here, but this will kind of guide you in and go, this is how you do it. And then it is time to fertilize. If you've got a brand, if this, especially for folks with brand new lawns, brand new flower beds, brand new trees, brand new hedgerows, any new landscape, you should really fertilize right now. Take advantage of the rain. It's huge. Uh, if your plants got stressed with the drought, you can get them to recover by fertilizing right now. So we'll, I've got that handout, those three handouts, fruit trees, berries, blueberries specifically, and then how to fertilize, okay? So, and that is gonna be via email. Throw that, throw me your email on there, and that's going to go to you probably this afternoon. You should be real simple. My desktop to yours. Just three links. Here you go. Download them at your pleasure. Do with them what you want. Share them with friends. They're not copyrighted. Go for it. We want to help people to garden better. So that's the class format today. Already questions in the back row? Really? So, no. This won't be for... Uh, that's for the, the garden club. So that's, a, I write a weekly garden column. So that goes out to everyone that's on our garden club. This is just for you all. Those three things, only for you. Yeah, just put it on there. It'll just be an, it'll be a separate tab just to you. Really simple, not polished, just kind of really quick going. I got, I got 15 minutes. Throw it to the class. 
That's what it'll be. So it'll just be three links, real simple, okay? So my name is Ken Lane. I own the Garden Center. So uh, Waters Garden Center has been a, in existence for, for 60 years. It's our 60th year in business. So my father-in-law, Harold Waters, thank you. It makes you feel better. I know I get like, I feel giddy all of a sudden. Thank you. Uh, my father-in-law started the Garden Center in 1962. At, not at this location. We were across town off of Plaza Drive, which is where the bowling alley is. So there's some office buildings right across the street from the bowling. That was, that was the Garden Center. Now it's all been developed. So we moved here. This is our new Garden Center in 1983. And so I'm the second generation owner. Ken Lane married Harold's youngest, prettiest daughter. That's kind of how it all works out. And so Harold had four daughters. Lisa's the youngest. Uh, we were college sweethearts, got married afterwards, did the corporate thing for a while. I was a corporate banker. I'd hate to be a banker right now. It'd be a nightmare. But anyway, that's what I used to do. And then I was a marketing director for Equifax. If you want your credit score, I was the guy that you cursed. If you didn't get the car, but if you did, you said, oh, I love that guy. I, I was the guy. And so I got tired of all that when I missed my little town. And Harold and I negotiated the <laughs> negotiated the, the business deal while chopping wood one Christmas. I was home for the holidays going, hey, I'd like to figure out how to come home. There are no jobs here, especially back in the 80s, 90s. And so uh, we just worked out a deal where he, we could pass the baton. Now I've got my daughters coming into the business. So we've got uh, the third generation now in training. Uh, Mackenzie, is, she's got her way more education than I'll ever dream of. Her master's in whatever high flute and thing. She said, I miss, I like retail. I'd like to come home. Same thing, same story. So she's in training to kind of take it the next thing. So I'm very proud to say that. So hopefully she can keep it going for another 30 years. That's kind of our history. So we have gardened in the area for decades. We know a thing or two. Uh, we got to get this out of the way right up front. Um, how many people are from Prescott? One, only one. Okay, let's try the other one. Chino Valley. Okay, Chino! Prescott Valley. <laughs> yeah, okay, the other half the group. That's Anyone else? Did I miss Dewey, Humboldt? Okay, there you go. There you go. So, gotcha. So, we're, we're all the same. It, it's not different. You aren't, Groom Creek isn't different from Prescott, isn't different from Prescott Valley, Chino, we're all the same. We are a strong zone seven. We need plants to go down to 10, five, 10 degrees, okay? Every once in a while we dip to sub-zero. It's freaky weird when that happens, but I've seen it a couple times in all my years. I like it as a garden center owner because it obliterates everything that's uh, <laughs> kind of borderline, sort of, which we get, we get kind of cocky going. We're definitely global warm. We have, we're zone seven, then it wipes it out. You got to start over. It's always a good year the following spring. So, but that's super, super, it's probably been 15 years since we've seen that. So rare. Definitely a zone seven. And what does that mean, zone seven? That's how cold, how much uh, antifreeze a plant has within the structure of that plant. So how cold can it go before it freezes? So plants don't put on parkas. They have actually antifreeze in the DNA, the, the sap of, their, of, their, of that plant. And so it puts them into, some of them could go down to minus 40, 50 degrees, like spruce trees, uh, lilacs. These are freaky cold plants from like the Midwest. They go really cold. Here we can grow a lot more. So you can grow zone seven, Six, five, four, three, two, one. In seven and lower, you can grow. So as you read the tags, you know, this is zone five. Well, you're good because you're zone seven. You can grow that one and all the other ones. You cannot grow. I can't say that. You all are gardeners. I never tell a gardener what they can or can't do because I'll <laughs> prove you wrong every time. But yeah, I flirt with zone eight sometimes. So that's, they can go down about 15 degrees. These are uh, 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 barrel cactus, some of the cacti things. I've got several that are quite old in containers, and they're out there in the yard right now in full sun. I bring them underneath my front overhang, so I put them next to the house, and the house throws off just enough heat where it doesn't freeze. For years it's been out there. So I've got several. I've got some palm trees I do that with. They don't grow up here unless you do some tricky stuff with them or bring them indoors. You folks with greenhouses, that's just cheating. So it's just, you can just, you, you've got more options than the rest of us without greenhouses. That's kind of where you could flirt with zone eight a little bit, nine, 10, 11, those are, that's Phoenix, Tucson. 
That's desert stuff. For sure, that's an annual plant. You even look at it with a cold thought, it dies. So that's, that's, that's kind of how the zones work. Your fruit trees, because we're going into that topic, fruit trees, you get tricked here. Because we've got so much influence from Phoenix and Tucson, our, 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 our University of uh, Ag Extension uh, University is, is Tucson, U of A. They provide all the agriculture uh, education for all the counties in Arizona. Well, that stuff doesn't necessarily translate up to this elevation. It's a little bit different. And so Phoenix, for sure, they broadcast all the news around the state. Everything you hear from them, just, just go erase, the, don't listen, turn the channel. HGTV, Fine Garden Magazine, these are all broadcast for the East Coast. They call it the Great Garden Arc. From Washington, D.C., Boston, Chicago to Seattle, that's where that's all the marketing dollars are for gardening. They don't, they don't care about you. There's not enough of us here that live here that they, they can write and promote things for. The great garden art in the industry is what it's called. So that kind of stuff, watch it, read it. It's inspiring, but it may or may not work at this elevation. So just kind of curate the, the you got to like make sure you check the feed. Not all of it's true, especially on Google. So uh, if you're part of our garden club, we write a garden column every week that's here for us. It's not something we purpose from Google. It's actually us. And so it's that sequence. When do you, when is the last frost? It's usually Mother's Day. When is the first frost? Usually it's about Halloween. So you know, you know those cycles that kind of happen. We try to help you with that. Going, oh, be aware. Or if there's a real heavy frost, some freaky frost, we'll try to put frost warnings out, that kind of stuff. So it's for us at this elevation. And you're all the same. I know we're all in this together. Prescott Valley is the same as Chino Valley, is the same as Skull Valley, is the same as Prescott, is the same as Groom Creek. We're all the same. As the same as Cottonwood, Camp Birdie. I know you're tuned in. Thanks for watching you all. We're trying not to forget you. So uh, anyway, that's kind of where we're at. With that being said, you need plants that bloom late in the season. So you're tricked into buying a lot of fruit trees that bloom early here. Because that Home Dumpo, I can't say that, Home Depot, I don't want to be cease and assess, sorry. Ah, Lucifer's Lowe's. Okay, anyway, they bring in their, their products for the desert. He goes, send 50 of those to all my stores all, all over the state. And they don't curate their desert plants sold up here. You'll see it all the time. We do not grow citrus. We do not grow avocados. You California folks, sorry, you can't do that. It's just too cold. You know, those things will go down to mid-20s. And then they die. So we for sure get down into teens every year, if not single digits, every winter. So by January 15, they're, they're, they're obliterated. So you, unless you can protect them and bring them indoors, you can't really grow those. We can grow the late blooming peaches, the late grooming plum, the late blooming uh, um, um, apricots and nectarines and cherries and apples and pears. We do those things really, really well. You just want to get one that has a lot of chill hours. So you'll read the tag that says, this has 300 chill hours, or this has 700 chill hours, which is pretty good. Or has 1,000 chill hours. What that is, plants are programmed, they're pretty smart, they're counting the hours, literally the hours that it's cold in the winter. Every night it gets chilly, freezes, and it puts, it's like a tick mark. It goes, okay, click that. I'm programmed to, after 700 hours, bloom. And so you want one, the desert varieties of two, three, 400 hours. And so that thing is blooming up here in February. If your last frost is Mother's Day, you should end of April, first part of May, somewhere in there typically, well, you've got a three month window where you have a chance to lose all your blossoms. The tree will grow fine. Will it produce fruit? Will it bloom? Yes. Well, the frost take the flower or the, or the fruit that forms. That's what you're trying to, with fruit trees, that's what you're really after. We also have what's called ornamental fruit trees. These are things like crab apples, ornamental pears, like Bradford pears. These are things that are actually, they, they bloom real early, and we know the fruit's going to be burned off. It's still a pear tree, it just doesn't form a fruit. So you get the great glossy foliage, the great shade tree size, that great fall color, but no fruit. That's 
those plants have been programmed to bloom and not, they just, they're used to being burned off. You don't want that for your honey crisp apple. You want these beautiful crisp melt in your mouth. My mouth just watered thinking about it. Fresh off the tree. You want that to form. That means you need to, uh, I think a honey crisp needs a thousand hours before it, before it blooms. It's not going to bloom until April, end of April. So it's out of that risk of frost. So that's, be aware of that. That's really a secret here. And never buy any, any plant from a warehouse. Come on. You're buying from Costco. You, you're going to get it from inside. It's probably not a variety for up here. And then it's going from outside, temperature controlled. And you put it out in your yard. The odds are stacked. Your, your, your mortality rate goes up dramatically. You want things that are acclimated, we call it, conditioned to be used to our climate our water, our sun, and our temperature when you plant it. It's going to be a game changer. So I see a lot of mistakes that way with, with fruit trees. The other one to watch, in addition to that, is, well, I'll get off my soapbox in the box stores. You can tell who my main competitors are. It's not the other small garden centers. It's the box stores and Amazon. So we like, we like to take them on, too. We do pretty good. Um, the other one to watch is cross-pollination. So some trees need a buddy. And so especially apples and pears, they're the main ones. They do better when you get two together. You'll get better production. Usually your pitted fruits, cherries, apricots, nectarines, peaches, usually they're self-fruitful. They have the male and female on the same plant, same, same tree. So they'll cross-pollinate each other. But a Bradford pear, or a, um, a Bartlett pear and a comice, you probably need two different ones to pollinate. So you need a honey crisp and a golden delicious. And I'll, again, I'll send those charts to you. You're going to have that in your inbox here shortly. It can, I have all the our fruit trees that grow, most of them that grow up here, and which ones cross pollinate each other. So just a real simple chart. And then on the end of all of our fruit tree racks, we have them right there too. So you can kind of check cross reference. So make sure sometimes when you've got a beautiful apple tree and it's three years old, it's not fruiting. It might be a pollination thing. When you're planting those trees, they do not need to be right next to each other. They just need to be within light of sight. So anywhere in the yard, they can even be in a neighbor's yard. As long as the bees can see that, bees aren't very smart. If you put a barn in between them, they aren't going to find it, a house or something. But if they're, as long as they're in the front yard and they can kind of fly from, they don't do this. When they fly, they, they go zoom, just like that. As long as they can see it, they'll pollinate it. So it could be 100 yards away. It's fine, as long as they can see it, okay? So that's something to watch. I see that quite often. People buy one tree and then it's not fruiting. They're going, why, it's, what's going on? The other one to watch too, you'll see this at some of the, like the, the marts, that kind of stuff. Uh, the fruit trees need to be about five to seven years old before they're old enough to fruit. Well, some of your discount places will sell what's called a whip, a, a younger tree. And so maybe it's only two or three years old, and you put it in the ground, you go, and I wanted fruit next spring. What's going on? It probably just has to mature two or three more years before it's old enough to start to, blow, to, to set fruit. It's a maturity thing. If you're shopping here at Waters Garden Center, all of our trees, we realize who our customer base is. Impatient. And so they want <laughs> fruit now. And so we, all of our trees are at least five years if not 10 to 12 years old. That's all of our trees are of fruiting age. We don't sell whips so for that reason, just for that reason. So that could be another thing to watch when you're, when, you're, when you're planting things. Okay, what kind of varieties and then how to plant? Let's go over that. So I brought a few things here. I'll just kind of bring them out. I, what I did is I have a bunch of fruit trees over there. It's a fine time to plant now. You're, you're good to go. We don't get that hot up here. This is hard for you. Phoenix folks to wrap your brain around. You don't plant in the summer down there. It's just, it's a furnace. But up here, I think it's going to be 88 today. It's humid. Yes, I'm hot. I'm sweating. I'm under pressure. Being in front of groups is so pressure packed. Actually, actually not. Actually like people. The bigger the audience, the more power. For someone that likes groups, it's like, it's like a weird, funky, they probably have medication for me. I just haven't found it yet. But anyway, and I feel a little gooey, but plants don't. They love that. They love the cloud cover of the, of the monsoons. They like the increased humidity. It's actually your hardest month to grow here in the mountains of Arizona, June. 
June is kind of hot, dry. It's very, it's, it's like 10% humidity. There's a prevailing southwest wind that's nonstop. Brand new growth. The trees have just started to leaf out. It's really hard. If you can just get plants to live through June, the monsoons come and you get, that's why if you fertilize right now, you can get a whole nother set of flowers. Uh, deadhead your roses, fertilize them. They'll be in full bloom by the end of, the, end of July. I mean, just glorious. You'll have some of the best blooms because you don't have the thrip and the aphids like you do in spring. So you can come in, it's almost like a second growing season, unique to this little bubble in the Southwest that helps us. It also goes for fruit trees. So you can get a whole nother set of growth on your, on your trees. Uh, sycamores. Sometimes they get kind of beat up by that frost we had, like, uh, was that in April or something? They got, they started to leaf out, then they got burned back. Now they're leafing out again, the ash, they got burned back. They come, if you fertilize them, they'll come back and you'll never know. In two, three weeks, you'll never know. They were even stunted. They just will flush. So things are going fast right now. So I brought my favorites. I've got a lot more than just this, but, uh, and I'll start with, with plums, because plums are kind of a freaky one. Santa Rosa plum is the most popular, and I have that. It's not my favorite, though. It's got kind of a tart skin, but sweet, sweet innards. I like, I like sweet on sweet, not, not bitter on sweet. So this is, a, this is a burgundy. It's a dark fruit skin with a dark center, dark uh, flesh that melts in your mouth. It's about that big. It's pretty, pretty heavy producer, self-fruitful. It, it just does this. You can see all this new growth. Now, I, I brought this one. Now, I'll do that with a peach. Yeah. So, so uh, plums, there's some native varieties of plums that grow here. Just wild. You see this wild, this, uh, it's got a white, white blossoms, usually in March, end of April. That's a plum, a variety of plum. Purple leaf plum. It's one of the hardiest of all the, the, the ornamental trees. Sometimes it can put a little tiny like cherry on it. Not always, but it can, but we don't sell it as a fruit tree. We sell it as an ornamental tree that the deer and the rabbits and the javelina seem to leave alone. It's got purple foliage to it. You've seen them in your neighborhood. This is related to that. Only it puts on the great big luscious fruits and it's a late bloomer. So this is called burgundy plum, Santa Rosa. There's, there's quite a few over there. I'll let you kind of kind of look at them. Um, Let's go over graphs, and I grow this one in a container. So I've got a hot tub, and I wanted some shade and some privacy for the hot tub because my neighbor loves to go. She gets ready every time I'm in the hot tub at night. She just flips all of a sudden the bedroom, the, the bathroom lights. It's not like she's spying on us. It's just you back light glows. Just feel like I'm, I want to be in private, my hot tub. And so I put one of these in a big pot. And I just grow it up there. It's beautiful. It puts on peaches like this every year. Um, if you're growing plants in containers, which you can do, uh, what I'll do is I will go back usually into mid to end of July, and I'll cut back all the suckers. So I want it to be proportionate. I want to keep the shape to it. I don't let it get too big if it's in a container. And so this new growth, you're seeing this, 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 this is all the, the summer growth. I'll just cut it back and go, nope, I'm not letting you get that big. You're done. That's usually it's after I've picked the peaches off. I'll start to cut it back and then just shape it. So summer pruning, I don't think we teach that enough for fruit tree growers, especially if you want to keep them smaller. Let's say you want a fruit tree off the patio or you want to use it as a shade tree, but you don't want it to tower above the 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 roof line, you want to keep it down here, you can do that with a fruit tree. And all you got to do is keep it shorter. Just take that summer, usually in July, take back that new growth and don't let it get too big. So with the trunk on this thing is like this, it's been in there for many, many years, but it still looks like a miniature. It's a standard peach, but I just keep it down. You can do that too. Yes. Yes, and there's always new spurs coming out. Even if, you, even if you're doing that, you've always got fruit. I might lose, I might have one bushel less peaches than you do if you let it grow big, but I don't want that many. I don't want it to get that big, so I just kind of keep it down. I've done the exact same thing. Uh, uh, my uh, first house in Prescott Valley, 
I had a fruit tree. The backyard was an orchard. This is a small lot, maybe a, not even a quarter acre, small. I just put it on the fence line with a six foot chain link fence. I just put one every eight feet around the yard, a different kind of fruit, all kinds of fruits. I just said, you can grow out there. And when it got too big, I just kept it. I just, I just trimmed it back. It was beautiful. And then in between each tree, I put a grape or a berry, blackberries, raspberries, that kind of stuff. It was like a, it was paradise. It felt, it felt, it felt good. And so you can do that too. You can cheat it a little bit, a little bigger, a little, you can get them a little bit smaller. Uh, your grandparents grew them at every 20 feet. That's how they had them in an orchard, lined up, perfectly spaced. Uh, so they could spray them, drive trucks and tractors in between them. You're not driving a tractor, a Ford Gannon mower thing between your trees in today's backyards, typically. Some of you are. Skull Valley, we did that. We had a traditional orchard. But in most backyards, not so much. Yeah. All I know is we're overthinking it. I get peaches every year, and I, I prune my back in the summer because I want to keep it small. So it again the oh, I do do a major pruning in midwinter. Usually, you're pruning most fruit trees January, February, March. That's when you're that's when you're opening up, crossing branches, all that kind of stuff. In the summer, all I do is just take it back. I don't want it to get too tall, and so I stand on top of my hot tub as far as I can reach. That's as big as you can get. Then I step back down going, perfect. That's the size I want it. So just the point being, you can grow in containers, fruit trees, um, bigger ones. So this is a larger, you know, bigger is better, more soil is better. And then the other secret too with container gardens, you got to do a lot of containers, not just fruit trees, but a lot of things, roses. Um, in the winter, make sure the plants don't get dry. That's the secret. So if there's a cold storm coming, you know, so you, you know what it is. Oh, it's going to be a cold one. It's coming from the north. Oh, my God. Everyone heads to the grocery store and they're like raids everything. When, before that event hits, just water your plants. They'll be fine. They've got antifreeze built into them. As long as they're moist and the water can flow back and forth on it, they're fine. It's when they get dry and then it goes real cold, that's when we get what's called winter kill. The, the tips will burn back on them. So just be aware of that. You're fine. Same with your yard. You'll see we saw a lot of bit, a lot of damage from the uh, um, the hedgerows, privacy screens. We saw a lot of damage. Red tip photinia, euonymus. Lots of the tops got burned off. Some of them actually got killed this last winter because we were in a drought. We didn't see a lot of of moisture, and then and then it got cold, and they just zapped them. If you'd simply turned that irrigation on once a month or so, it would have kept them hydrated enough to keep that from happening. So anyway, that's just something to watch. Wasn't part of the class. Um, apricots, go over this. Um, apricots are the very first plant to bloom in the spring of the year. There's only two varieties I would plant here, Chinese or Mormon apricots. Those are the names. This is a Chinese apricot. It forms a fruit about like that. Apricots seem to be a feast or famine kind of plant. Either have none or just a few, or you have so many, you better have the canning. You better have the, the drying machine. You better be ready because you're going to have bushels. You better have friends too. So it's going to be so many, it'd be ridiculous. It's one, one or the other. But this one needs, I think, 900 or 1,000 chilling hours. So it gets you right out there. All the, so out of all the apricots, some only take 200 chilling hours. They're, they're blooming in February, first part of March. And some take much longer. So they're blooming into April. So we're getting out of that frost damage. And so you want those varieties. So that's, that's why I brought this one. Just kind of, if you're going to do an apricot, do this one. There's nothing better than a fresh apricot. That's when they pick way too early for shipping. And so they ripen up typically into boxes. But if you keep it on that tree just just that last week, oh, they're so much better. They're so much sweeter uh, than store-bought. So anyway, okay. What else I got? Oh, a pear. I could keep going. There's apples. Uh, the, the, the pears do exceptionally well 
pears are super expensive at the grocery store. I don't know why. Why should they do? They should not be three, four dollars a pound. That's ridiculous. So you can grow them yourself so easy. They're just one of the easiest plants and the consistent. So if you're going to start with fruit, start with apples and pears. And here's the reason why. They're the last fruit tree to bloom in the spring of the year. So they're the most consistent with fruit. Almost every single year you're going to get pears. Almost every year you're going to get apples. Then it would be peaches and cherries. They're pretty consistent, but they bloom just a week or two earlier than apples and pears. Then it would be nectarines and it's apricot. I guess then it would be plums, then nectarines, then apricots. It's kind of a sequence. Don't start with apricots because you might get fruit every other year because they, they're the first one to bloom in the spring of the, spring of the year. Does that make sense? So, okay, just kind of experience, just things I've kind of learned over the decades. Okay, I brought this one too. Now let's go, let me not cover that because I may run out of time. Let's do this, how to plant. So when you're planting, let's put this pear tree up here. So here's a mistake, and if you Google how to plant a tree, you'll get a, it's mind-numbing how many suggestions you get. Most of them are wrong. Uh, but here at Waters Garden Center, we're here for you. We have, I have killed a lot of plants, and, and this is especially important for you all out in that heavy clay. If you got a, some of you are that backside of Prescott Valley, I mean, you walk on this rain, you walk on raw earth, you're like, you start to grow, the, the mud just sticks to your feet. It's just rocks start to emerge. I call them potatoes or something. They just, they just float up out of the ground. It's wild. So those areas are difficult to get plants to root. So plants don't like different kinds of soils. And so, and, and it doesn't perk or, or it doesn't drain well. And so you want these plants need to breathe at their roots. They give off oxygen at the, at the foliage, but they need oxygen down here. And so if that rain event, we had 1.7 inches of rain or, or very well in excess of an inch of rain last night. We've had two nights in a row of that. So that the ground is getting saturated. That's good. We need that. Um, so if that plant sits there in moisture and can't breathe, it'll literally root rot. So the roots will literally rot off the, rot off the plant. So a little trick that I've used, only dig the hole as deep as the root ball. Don't go down to China. This is hard for you contractors. You think, I mean, you guys that own tractors and jackhammers, you love, I've seen guys like up to their chest in holes. I'm like, what? what are you doing down there? Get out of there. What are you doing? Roots don't go down. Here. There's no tap root. They're not, they're not, there's nothing for them to go down after. There's no water, there's no nutrients, there's no humic anything. There's nothing but more rocks, caliche, and gunk down there. And some of you, the contractor buried his debris down there. There's literally nothing down there for him. And so the roots all go sideways here. That's how the plants naturally grow. Even the big natives, you'll see they'll grow about two, three feet down. Even a big juniper, big ponderosa. They'll go down two, three feet, and then the roots go sideways. And, and the roots can go hundreds of feet in every direction. If you know that's how the plant's going to grow, encourage it to grow that way. And so you just dig the bowl hole as deep as, as, as deep as a bucket, but three times as wide, kind of saucer-shaped. It's easier to dig a wide hole than a deep hole every time. And so just dig that. The soil you got over here, some of you are going to need to screen your soil. Anything bigger than a golf ball get rid of it. It just heats up in summer and bakes the roots. So just screen down. If you got big rocks, get rid of that stuff. Uh, uh, old roots, they are not good. As those things decompose, they taint the soil so other roots won't grow near them. So, so screen all those old weed, tree, rocks, screen that out. Some of you have got nice soil, you've got granite or whatever, that's fine. Just, just the rocky, chunky stuff, get that out of there. What's left, you want to amend with some mulch. I brought premium mulch, this stuff. Just this is, uh, we harvest this from an old sawmill over in Taylor, Arizona, the White Mountain area. So it's screened down to, to quarter inch minus. It's just compost. It's chocolatey looking compost. And it's made to add to our native earth. It's made to keep that soil from compacting right back down to this hard, hard base. It allows the roots to get through. So it's going from this beautiful, Rich soil 
to your crummy stuff, that's hard on a plant. It is going to go into transplant shock. It's going to freak out. And so this helps add more of this into the surrounding soil so it can root out. And main thing is it keeps that clay soil. I mean, you'd water clay soil. You'd loosen it up going, oh, it'll stay loose. The second you water, it goes right back to its natural state. Heavy clay. It keeps it fluffy so the roots can get through it. Okay. Backfill that mixture. About 25% uh, this to your native soil. It's got to get used to the soil. We're just trying to get it to keep it from, we're just trying to add some organic stuff to, 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 to keep it from compacting back down. So about one shovel of, of mulch to three shovels of, of native earth that helps you, okay? You can cheat it. If you got a big boulder, bless you. Some of you got a great big old boulder, you, gotta, you can go 50-50. More than that, it's, this gets, stays too gooey. There we probably want to amend some topsoil. There's some other things that happen. That, that's, that's not the norm. Usually you're going to use the soil, amend it, backfill. Okay. The next secret. Um, for if you got heavy clay soil, this will make this will be a game changer for you. Leave about that much of the root, about two, three inches of root out of the ground. And put on a slight mound. Just mound on a very slight mound. Just kind of same width, but just slightly mound it. So you, no matter the amount of monsoon rain, typically is when the damage is done. No matter how much moisture we get, at least that much of the roots can breathe. So whatever you do, don't put it in a divot. Don't rain harvest. You do not want to rain harvest up at this altitude. This is the curse of Phoenix. Downward, it's 110 degrees at midnight. You can do that. But up here in God's country, where you ought to live, where it cools off in the evening, where it's, where it's pleasant, here those plants will stay wet. And they'll stay gooey. They'll stay too wet and will we'll encourage root rot, some other fungal things that happen. So you want to at least ground level, if not slightly elevated. And I find slightly elevated for the Prescott Valley, those harder, the new parts of Chino Valley, the older parts are the old farm lands, great. All the hill, hillsides, terrible. It's Prescott Valley, basically. Caliche layers, those are all areas where it's hard to get things to root. That, that little trick will really make a difference for you, okay? Um, and then you're going to put a handful of all-purpose plant food. When you get it all compacted back in, just you need to fertilize it. So your, your soil has nothing redeeming about it. There's no food. There's no worms. There's no mycorrhizal colony. There's nothing good that the plant can feed off of. This helps to encourage that, okay? Then you're going to water it in when you're all done with root and grow. This is a compost tea. Basically, we stew our own tea. We take the compost. We just boil it, and you get this concentrated, like, good stuff. The plants, they love this stuff. It's a liquid. It's concentrated. You mix up your watering can, and I'll just water it in. Use this every two weeks until you see the plant stabilize. You're going, oh, oh, it's growing. New growth. I'm a gardener. Look at this thing. It's growing. Then you cut it off of this. It stabilizes. no longer in transplant shock. You should be fine without this. Okay, so that's when the fertilizer will actually take off. That's how you plant. The other thing to watch, too, I see this mistake a lot. Um, I know I keep saying mistakes. I'm just trying to keep you from making you, know, you learn gardening by making mistakes. I'm just sharing a few that I've made over the years and to keep you from having to learn them the hard way. Uh, make sure if you're in a windy area, that plant does not lean, especially fruit trees. You may need to stake the tree. So we have a lodgepole kit. It's, you don't want to use tiny stakes. They wiggle their way out of the ground. You want to use a bigger, bigger wood stake, one on either side, just on either side of the root ball, tied once, for a small tree, maybe twice for a really big tree, most fruit trees once. You want it to move, you want it to get strong in the wind, you just don't want it leaning. If it starts to lean and it puts on one layer of root, one, uh, not root, uh, uh, wood ring, it solidifies in that direction. And you can't, you can't correct it, you can't bring it back. So you wanna make sure it grows straight from the start. I've literally see, seen fruit trees fall out of the ground. They'll be leaning like this. They'll be leaning to the northeast because that's where wind, wind blows. And then it'll load up with apples and literally just fall over. It's just, you'll put on 
300 pounds of apples or peaches or something, plums, and it just literally will fall over. And, and just it just falls over because it wasn't straight. Make sure it's straight with fruit trees. Shade tree's not as important. It's important. It looks funny. Trees should not be leaning. They should be straight, but especially fruit trees. So it's something to watch. Some of you are protected. Some of you have a backyard. You have fencing or whatever, houses. It's not a big issue, but monitor that if you need to. Come in and get a steak kit for $19.99. Wire, steaks, the tie, the whole thing. It's, they're pretty inexpensive, but just watch it. Okay, all right, that's how you plant. Any questions? Watering, should we do that? Yep. Ornamental pears, yep, or ornamental plants. Yeah, some of them they don't. So purple leaf plum, they don't eat that. So deer and antelope, it's, it's, they look delicious, but they won't. So when, when she gets ready, bring her in, have a girl's day out, and, and we'll, we'll walk her through and show her which ones are better than others for, for, uh, for, for that. Yeah? Um, I moved into a house that has um, wannabes, but, um, Fruit trees? Yeah. Uh, okay. The plum and the apples yep. were just loaded when I first moved there. Now they have what I call wallace salad. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Suckers. I don't know what's happening, but the gardening is talking. That's where gardening, with more gardeners, the better, because we just kind of flush it out amongst each other. Perfect. Yeah, I think that's that's advisable. No, oh, I know. Yeah, we should cover that real quick. Let's just cover that. So we got the two varieties. So I make two fertilizers. I I love killing things. That's my thing. It's a gopher, it should die. Roaches, blister beetle, grasshoppers. I like killing things. Weeds, I like killing things. So I know how to do that, especially we make some of our own killers. I like making things grow. It's like this is make foods, plant foods are kind of like a cookie recipe. You get it just right and just the plants go, oh, this is so good. And they respond instantly. And so I, I've been tweaking different fertilizers myself for decades. And so we package two of them. We actually have three. We've got a flower food, but I didn't bring that up here. These two, um, this is the all-purpose food that you mentioned. This is our original food. Uh, evergreens are going to love this. Uh, your your uh, uh, roses, it's cottonseed meal is a main ingredient, loves this. Lawns, it's got bird guano in it. Food manures, especially bird manures, really make things that grow fast, grows grows fast. It's granular. Spread it on the ground, pray for rain. That's why the monsoons are so perfect for this. The, this whole organic, uh, sustainable thing is really pronounced. It's really the younger generations driving this. The, the millennial 40 and under folks, they, they want to grow their own. We're seeing more families getting back involved with gardening. It's kind of exciting. There's a renaissance with gardening coming coming our way. It's, it's happened, I think pandemic just made it explode. Well, we made an organic food. This I could not call organic because we put sulfur and iron in it. So as you put a mineral in it, you can't technically call it organic. You call it natural, but you can't call it organic. This is purely organic. And so now I can actually, those folks that are truly hardcore, organic makes them happy. So this is made for Fruit trees, berries, grapes, things that are edible, strawberries, tomatoes. Um, and then we bumped it with a whole lot of calcium. Uh, if you want to bring out the size of a fruit or the flavor of, of, of edibles, calcium is what really does it. And we have a calcium deficiency here. So this is called 6447. So we put an extra number at 7% calcium. That's the difference between the two. It is all organic. So like you said... Animals will like to eat it, like dogs, coyotes, cats, that kind of stuff. So kind of watch that. Usually I like to put it on. I like to mix this in my vegetable gardens when I'm turning it because it gets it in the ground. It's great for tomatoes, that kind of stuff, because tomatoes, they're famous for blossom end rot or, the, or they're smaller in size or 
this the skin gets too thick, that's calcium. Those are calcium issues. This helps with that. If you're spraying it on the ground, do it in a rainstorm. Helps it di digest and kind of get down there so the animals don't find it as much. The good thing is, if you're attracting dogs and coyotes and cats, it probably will keep the rabbits and rats and mice away because they're, they're always afraid of, but it's blood meals and bone meals and feather meals. It's got all the meals in it. That's what the main ingredients. Pelletize, spread it, and then the rain breaks it down over like a three-month period. That's really the difference. So on edible things, like we've been talking about, this is ideal. If you just had to pick one or the other for the entire yard, I want my pine trees and I want my roses. I want everything, this one. Okay, so that's the difference. It makes sense. So again, we can talk offline and kind of go over more. Yeah. Quick question um, I was actually going to ask earlier. The liquid that you had. The, 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 the root and grow, yeah. yeah. So for instance, the spring when we had that hard freeze after the yeah. temperatures, I have your organic food, um, yep. the pellets. Yep. And I put some of that on, but is that something that would have been a better option for Good them? question. So for you folks online, go over here. Um, so that freeze we had burned off the foliage or stress plant, just any stress plant. She'd come in and, and, and put the organic foods on. Would this have been better? I don't think it matters. Just get one. This is more readily available quicker right immediately right now. But for a great big tree, this is not as economical. This is much better to spread over the entire drip line than taking, you know, five 10, 15 gallons of this and trying to get it. It's not practical. This is made for new things. Great houseplant food, great to cactus food, things that like like a liquid thing. This is better for the long term. Yeah, brand new. This could that could be good. This could be really good. That could have been really good. Yeah. So that's where there's more than one answer. In gardening, there's always more than one answer. But, but great question. And you you respond. Your plants, you're talking to your plants. And, and they're, you're responding. You gardeners, you kind of go, oh, look, a little dry. Or, oh, we need to, the color's a little off. We need to give them some food. Those are all, that's gardening. That's how you do it. Okay. Great question. So, how are you doing on time? I've got 10 minutes. Why don't I go over the summer plants that you just haven't seen before? It's not related to the topic, but it's things like this. This is something that just came in. This is one of the only hardy hibiscus that grows here. This is Mashudos hibiscus. You folks from the tropical climates, your Palm Springs, Southern California, Hawaii, you're used to hibiscus this big, but in a tree form. That variety does not grow here. It's tropical. It burns out in the winter. This one does. Mashudos hibiscus, you'll start to see these all around town. It's actually a perennial. That is, it hibernates underground for the winter. Then it flushes all new growth, and they'll be up about three, four feet. This great big shrub covered. You can just see these, these buds are just coming on just, just now. It's a summer through fall hibiscus. It's one of the few big hibiscus that grows at this elevation, at the mile high and above. Okay, We, we grow the uh, Rose of Sharon uh, hibiscus. It's a smaller flower. It's a shrub. Gets up pretty big, but the flowers aren't this big. It, they're, they're like this big, so it's different. And there are different colors, that kind of stuff. But I brought it to you going, they've never seen this, even a hardcore gardener. This one's a new one that we haven't had. Usually they're green foliage. This one's got that purple foliage. It's a little bit different. Shows off the lighter color flower. The green ones are typically red on green. This is a lighter color on dark foliage. It's just having fun with different kinds of plants. But you only see this at the garden center this time of year. In the spring, it's basically a nub in a bucket, and no one buys it. So we keep it at the farm till it flushes out, puts on a flower, and then this is like candy. Every cart will have one until they're all gone, and then there's no more until next summer and fall. So it's kind of Mishudos hibiscus. And sometimes you'll, the South calls it a Confederate rose. I don't know why. In the West, we call it Mashudos, but it goes by a couple of common names. So it goes with, oh, I, I got to show this one. It's the big boy because it's starting to bloom all around town. Let's see, of course, everything's wet right now because it rained so heavy last night. So maximum weight. You're seeing this starting to bloom all around town right now. It's called a smoke bush or smoke tree. 
it can get rather large. It can be up easily well above head high. It can be up that 10, 12 foot range. Or it can be tr trimmed. So you'll see it in shrub forms, kind of chest high or so, or, or tree. But in the summer, it does this. The flower looks like smoke, thus the name smoke bush. The foliage is actually like this. Comes out, it's just now, it's been doing this, just now starting to flower. Comes in green, chartreuse, and kind of this purple is the most common. The smoke bush, all around town, you're seeing this. It's very common. I thought I'd just show it to you going, it's a summer plant. You've been wondering what it is. Here it is, this smoke bush. It goes, in fact, I'll put these together because they're kind of companion plants. It goes with this and this. This is butterfly bush. The most common one's purple, dark night. Your grandparents grew one, has a great big purple flower to it. Grew up like the size of like a barn. Gets pretty big. This is kind of a, a white one. Very unusual to see white. Usually it's variations of blue. We do have reds, kind of a dark pink kind of colors, but white's just super unusual. Butterflies, you will have butterflies. They cannot resist this bush. I mean, it gets up about, oh, this tall. We get different, different sizes, so it depends on what, what size you want, but they all put on this long pinnacle flower to it, and butterflies love it, and summer's their time to shine, summer through fall. This one is less common, this is called chaste tree. It gets up. It looks innocent. This will literally get 10 feet tall, 10, 12 feet. It's like a, like a really tall shrub or, or short tree. It grows kind of vase-shaped like this. We plant these together. These are all bright sun. Expose them to the wind. They just like that. They like growing up here. Chaste tree loves butterflies. It's a, it's a pollinator as well, so bees, butterflies, hummingbirds like this particular plant, but it'll bloom like this. Gets The whole top of it will be covered with these blue flowers kind of all summer and fall. So then it's got a bright kind of aspen gold color in the fall of the year, and then it's deciduous. That is, it will lose its foliage in the winter. All, all of these will lose their foliage in the winter. So chase tree. Again, I don't have this plant in the spring. I only have it summer through fall. People come ask for me, sorry. It's just ugly in the spring. It's a late bloomer. It has no interest in spring because I'm not blooming. I'm not leafing out until I'm warm. So once that soil temperature reaches up in that 50, 60 degrees, it goes, okay, I'm ready to go. Boom, just takes off. Uh, another companion is um, a desert willow. You're starting to see along the side of the highways, a native tree about the same size. It's got a pink flower to it, white to pink, kind of apple blossom to pink flower. So that's a desert willow. It's the same size. They're all companion plants to each other. Hummingbirds like that one too. Okay, another one that you just don't see very often. Just brought it because it's freaky interesting. Again, I know I'm talking to gardeners. This is a gardener's class. I want to know how to do fruit trees. What variety? How do I plant? Detail questions. This is red yucca, but it's not red. This is a yellow yucca. You always see red or that salmon color. It's got a Red to kind of lighter pink or darker pink kind of colors. Very unusual to see yellow. Again, we get bored with plants. And I go, just give me anything besides, I, could put, I put my kids through college by selling red yucca. But yellow is kind of interesting. Same thing, but gets the same, just dozens and dozens of flowers. The secret with all of your yuccas, no matter the variety, when it's done blooming, usually September, October, you're seeing all these seed pods on there. You can take this and cut off that one flower. Don't let your gardeners treat this like a grass and cut off the foliage. I've seen that so many times, and it takes years to recover. It's just a rookie move. They didn't know. They thought it was like a pampas grass or something. You keep the foliage intact. You just take the stem off. Same with your uh, iris. Right now I'm starting to cut back my irises. They've been in bloom for two months. I'm just taking the flower off, keeping the actual the pads, that, that foliage up, so it can create the photosynthesis to make next spring's flower. So don't, don't, I see too many folks just take the mower and go right over it. So just, I just brought it because it's unusual, yellow, instead of red. Another one, 
um, and it doesn't look like much, I know, but we're the only place that sells manzanita up here. We have figured out how to grow manzanita. It's very difficult. Uh, it's hard to get it to roots, what it is. You can do it, you're starting by cuttings, and then to get those cuttings to take, we sh that's a challenge. It took a while, but we figured out how to do it. This is an Austin something. This is the big variety. It's got, it's just like our native one that grows here, but the leaf is just a little bit bigger. It's a little bit showier. It'll actually get this super red bark to it. It's an evergreen. So it has, it's got uh, just as this, only more of it up to about head high. You can actually trim this one. I've seen it really pretty where it's trimmed, like the bottom where it shows off the red bark and they keep the foliage up top and has that same bell-shaped flower. Usually in March, you're seeing this pretty little flower to it. The bees, it's one of their only food sources in the spring of the year. They're, they'll be all over this. It's a good pollinator for, for the early things that are pollinating real early in the spring. So anyway, manzanita. This is one too. Do not add this to your irrigation. School of Hard Knocks, I've killed several of these. Don't water it, ignore it, curse at it, kick dirt at it, but don't water it. Water it by hand every once in a while when you think about it, and this one will be happy with that. It's a true, true native. So if you kill this, it'll be from overwatering. okay? Yeah, probably so. That's one too, is it okay for the monsoon season? That's one that I would plant on a slight mound if you got real heavy clay, because that'll guarantee that at least that much of the roots breathe. If you got real heavy clay and it's and water's flowing by it, it's not going to be happy with that. It won't be happy next to a lawn, flower beds. It's going to want to be out there, surrounded by dark colored rock, roasting in the sun. That's where manzanita is happy. That's where it's going to go. Okay, I brought this. This is just man. It's just rosemary. Nothing fancy, uh, but I brought it in that bees are, 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 are challenged sometimes. We take their native environment, we scrape it so nothing is left, then we put roads in in your house and your driveways. We wonder where the bees went. They are there in it. There's nothing there for them. So you need to put a few plants in for them, and they, they naturally will come back. The, the, native, the native hives will come back to you, the wild hives. And they love rosemary. Rosemary I'll put out there in my fruit tree areas because usually this will bloom about the time the fruit trees are blooming. So March and April is when this blooms. And, and you can pull bees into those trees and attract them because any, any blue blues and yellows, bees just love blues and yellows. And so this is one of their, this is one of their favorite flavors. I brought this one because it's a barbecue rosemary. I have this one in my own yard. It puts on these big, long branches. What you do is you trim that off, strip off the, uh, the fold and use them as skewers. The most delicious pork grilled chickens you've ever had. Oh, it's so delicious. Oh my gosh. But this has longer stems to be able to do that. So anyway, just not every, not every rosemary does well up here too. Some of them are desert varieties. They don't translate up here. So they, they struggle or die. You kind of want to, especially the ground cover varieties, they're a little more sensitive. So, so be, you should only shop at Waters Garden Center. <laughs> there you go. You heard it from me. We only sell, we don't sell the desert varieties. We only sell the ones up here. This is barbecue, but there's Huntington carpet. There's Tuscan blue over there, several, but I brought that one just for the lesson. It blooms when all your fruit trees are. It also helps, blooms twice, blooms in the fall too. And then it's just fun if you like grilling in the backyard. That's a fun one. Um, I brought another one here. There's something hummingbird. Here we go. Some flower things. And then I'll let you go. We're, we're at an hour. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. After these, how about that? The watering is really easy. Um, okay, so anyone know what that is? Humming per, uh, hummingbird mint is the name. It's a summer bloomer. Hummingbirds do actually love it. Animals seem to, it's got a minty kind of uh, herbally scent to it. It just gets this big, and it just is covered with flowers all summer. You don't see this. First of all, no one's brave enough to sell it, so it's so specialized. Then it only blooms after the season's over, so you're not going to see it at a box. It's only going to be at a hardcore garden center. But hummingbird mint is the name of that, and it's just pretty. It goes in a container, flows over. It's perennial. Come back year after year. Or you can just put it in the ground. It's super tough. 
a rabbit's going to leave it alone, that kind of stuff. It goes with this. I don't think we sell this one enough. Bee balm, yeah, good call. Bee balm gets tall and beautiful. Butterflies, hummingbirds, bees, they all like it. And, and it's, it's herbally. Herbally things seem to, the, the javelina, rabbits, the animals seem to leave it alone. So this is a taller thing. It gets up pretty substantial. This is, this is as tall as it gets. You can see it now it's starting to flow over the pot. I brought this, probably the most common plant of all of them. Oops, poor thing. My staff hates it when I start showing plants, especially when I'm going out someplace. They come back brutalized. Um, this is echinacea or cone flower. Now, your, your grandparents grew it. It was purple, just a purple flower. That was a standard for decades. It is so tough, so hardy for here. It's a true wildflower up here. Uh, we're trying to introduce new colors. So you see some, some I think, wild berries, some reds, yellow. It's just freaky, unusual for this plant. It's another one you're only going to find here just because I like flower. I like my flower, flower guy. What I do with this in my backyard, this is one that benefits from deadheading. So when this is done blooming, I'll pinch this off. And you're seeing all these other flowers come on it, and it will just keep pushing flowers. As long as you feed it and deadhead it, it'll keep pushing flowers. I'm a bird gardener. I like birds. I've had over 90 varieties of birds in my own backyard. I've seen a bald eagle float across my backyard. So I've got the plants, and I have the water. I've basically got a pond in my backyard. That's cheating, too. But it's pretty, and it sounds good, and it goes with the whole flow. Uh, but I'll leave this out there for my winter birds. What I'll do is I'll deadhead this until the end of September. That last set of flowers through October, I'll let them go to seed like this, and I'll keep them up there. And my little finches, the things that winter over with me, will use that as a food source. The, the birds that eat seed, they'll use it as a food source. And they just migrate. They come into the gardens. There's several plants that I do that with. This is one of them. So, And then this one's everywhere. It's a weed. You know what it is. Mexican primrose. Don't introduce this into the middle of your flower bed, or this is all you'll have within two or three years. It's so aggressive. But you put it out there by the street, have the Amazon man run over it every once in a while. It's great for that. Put it down where the driveway, where all that, where the kids' cars, all that, you know, they got the leaky cars. And all the gunk kind of roll, rolls, and this will filter all that stuff out of there. All that break dust, and just take, it's a great place for that. So it's very robust. This is as big as it gets, tall, but then it spreads like this. Just kind of, it'll touch, recede, go again. It just kind of jumps across the yard like the Mexican primrose. The other one with this, though, when it's done blooming, it'll start to seed on you. I'll take my weed whacker and just whack it off, fertilize it, usually with the all-purpose food, this one. I'll just fertilize it with this, and it will be back in bloom within two weeks. It's amazing. You can keep this blooming over and over. Same with my uh, a meadow sage. I've got a real, it's a, it's a low sage. It's related to the culinary sage like that, but it blooms. Um, I just cut mine back. It's been in bloom for two months. Just cut it back, put the food on it. It'll literally come right back into bloom on me. I can get two, three different bloom cycles on that just by doing that. So dead head. Keep it going in the back. This would do great, yeah. Window box, yeah. It'd be a weed. Again, what you might do there is, is cut it back a little bit more just so you can keep it blooming. And in a window box, fertilize it with the flower power. This is a water soluble, so it's got a scoop in it, so one scoop per gallon. So window box containers, raised beds, the areas that, like that. This is probably a better food for that. It'll keep it blooming more because you want window boxes to be like over the top. So that that would do it. Yep. Full sun, at least six hours or more. So minimum six to really get the flower. Otherwise, it'll just be green. It won't be as inspiring. To get those flowers, it's going to take some sun to pull that off. Yep. Uh, rabbits don't eat these. Uh, I don't know about all of them. Yeah, they don't eat. They don't eat this. If they do, good. You need it. You need to be eaten on sometimes. It's so aggressive. So yeah, it's just you can't kill this. In fact, it, it'll want to jump areas that you don't. Don't let it jump. Like I've got a stream bed. 
a kind of fake dry, dry stream bed. I don't want it over there. I want it over here and it wants to go over there. I just spray it with decimate. I've got a weed killer, it wipes this right out. I just don't let it grow over there, but I got to spray it pretty often in the summer to keep it that, keep it back. Yeah. Would it do okay with like fountain grasses and that type of thing or would it kill that off as the, well? Oh no, fountain. So, so her question was um, fountain grasses, things that are taller, spikier. Yeah. The one I, I use often with this is uh, Russian sage. Right. It's that purple spiky thing. I'll plant this around it so you get the pink, yeah. mat of pink with purple out of it. It's right. beautiful. It, it, it won't choke it out. Just other low, if you put these two things together, this is going to win. It's that kind of stuff. But sometimes you like that Darwin and, you know, experiment, see who survives and who doesn't. So it's okay to do that, especially in containers. Any last questions? Then we'll go over watering, then we'll release you. Okay. So, yep, online. Yeah, go for it. This year, nothing is this due to the green. Yes. So, Sarah, great question. So, we had two major frost events this year. One of them was like I've never seen. It was really bad. So, the one early on in March, ah, we see that. It was a light, quick frost. It went out. And then we had one in April that was that was a freaky one. We, I, In fact, Lisa and I were debating, should we send a frost warning out? I'm not quite sure. It doesn't look that bad. And I said, no, she said, yes, she always wins. So we sent a frost alert out to our garden core. We said, you know, you probably ought to water things, cover things up, just make sure. And then we woke up the next morning. It was like 22, 21 degrees. It was at 19 degrees at my house. That it, there's no way to recover from that. And that's what took your fruit out. That last frost is what took it. We're seeing a few peaches, apples and pears seem to be around. Uh, the apricots, nectarines, plums, they got they got obliterated. So it depends, sort of it depends on your elevation. The other one you can do too, well, on that same topic, Sarah, thank you for that. Um, everyone wants to plant at the low end of the, of the yard, uh, next to the creek bed. Um, that's not where you want to plant fruit trees because cold air settles. And so that kind of event, more damage. If you can feel it when you're walking your neighborhood, but you'll go down the hill if you feel the cold. Warm air rises, so up, if you've got elevation change, plant on the upper end of your properties, because warm air rises, you'll get less damage. Just I just experienced that myself and seen that where I didn't have any damage. So was there something else online, Ken? Is that it? Uh, yes, actually, tying in with your watering. Yeah. Maureen says, if the roots grow sideways, how come we suggest that you water so much? So, Maureen, great question. Um, because it takes a long time to get water to, to soak two, three feet into the ground. These are drip systems. So typically we're, we're all using one gallon per hour emitter heads. So the water's got to run for an hour to get one gallon of water. And you, you might need two or three, this 10, 10 gallon size tree might need 10 gallons a week. So how long do you have to run that system with one emitter? 10 hours. You might need two or three emitters or you might do it twice a week to get enough moisture through that root ball. It also means that you'll probably need to adjust or maintain your drip system as the plant grows. So as this plant grows out, the drip line is where all the feeder roots are. So you may, we put the emitters right at the base of the tree because that's where the roots are when you first plant it. Three, four, five years out, you might actually need to move your emitters further out and maybe add a couple so we're, we're feeding the drip line. As a tree matures, the, at the base is just anchoring roots. These are big, hairy, barky roots, and they don't take in water at all. They can't even take in food. All the food and water roots are real fine root hairs. They look real white, real, real fine, hairy, white roots, and they're out towards the tip. They'll typically be, if I'm the trunk, these are my branches, they'll typically be halfway out to, to out there. That's where you need to focus your food and your water, especially for more mature things. New landscapes focus in at the roots, obviously. It takes a couple of years for the roots to finally get out there where they're really robust and hardy trees. So that's why you're watering two times a week for brand new plants. So I just plant a, I'm gonna plant a brand new uh, pear tree in my yard 
because I like Chris, I like red Bartlett pears. You can't get red pears. You can, you don't have to plant them. I'm going to plant that. You're probably going to water this twice a week is good enough. Um, once it's established, that is, once it's rooted, usually after your second season, it's been in the ground for the second spring, usually after that, you can water it once a week, a deep soak. That's more than enough for trees. Again, you're going to water that root. That soil is going to be watered two, three feet down. So it's going to take a while for that, that soil to dry out. So the mistake I find newbies make, this is really the Northwest folks. They're used to water every day. I don't know what they're thinking, but they're thinking I'll water every single day and that'll make the plant happy. It does not make the plant happy. It makes them root rot on you, especially when you put one or two rain events towards the evening up here at this elevation, you're going to get root rot. So one deep soak for most established plants, for a lot of brand new plants, you might add them to your drip system and run it once a week and water that one extra time by hand. Just add that extra water by hand if you need to get that extra. So you can balance out established plants with a new plant just getting out there. So a technique that really works. Does that make sense? We just covered watering just like that. So water, keep that system on for minimum of an hour, if not two or three hours, depending on how many emitters you have. So you need to run it a long time, but then shut it down. Let those plants air out between it until it waters the next time. Okay. Back to the trees and fruit trees. Um, at what stage of the, the blossom will, I just think if I got blossoms and the wind didn't come, yeah. the tree's going to be okay, but I don't have any fruit. So does the freeze kill the blossoms or before? Or the buds. Or yeah, good question. So our question was for you folks online, um, was it Maureen and Sarah? Was that who's online? Yes. And everyone else, thank you for asking questions. But anyway, um, so the question was, when, at what stage is the flower at risk of being damaged in the spring by frost? It's when that, it's not the bud, bud is still being fed by the antifreeze within the structure of the plant and it hasn't fully formed. Once that flower bud opens, it's now at risk. That's, or when it fruits, that fruit, if you were to take that fruit and throw it in the freezer, how good is a nice rich peach when you get it out of the freezer, what does it turn? It turns to mush when you bring it out. That does it on the tree too. When it freezes, it turns to mush. So it just it just fades and drops off. So that's so when it's in flower, that's why if you get a light frost in spring, sometimes the things that were in bloom they get zipped. But then some of the some of the inside core buds that haven't opened yet will form will form flower um, um, will flower and fruit. So you, you get that. So does that answer the question? Yeah. Yep. I have multiple fruit trees that I planted this year. Um, just learning about them. Yep. Learned about how you need to, with the apples and pears, uh, make sure you you're spraying the blossoms so that you don't get the worms. Yep. Okay. Later. Yeah. Do I have to worry about anything like that with the pitted, like with the pear? The so she wants me to go into bugs. I got a whole hour another oh, program on that. <laughs> just bugs. That's one. If you see insects, come see us right away. If you could. Bring a branch in a Ziploc baggie. I don't want to spread like mildew is out right now. It spreads so easy. Uh, bugs translate over and start to populate my trees. We're trying to keep them clean. So kind of Ziploc, and we'll put them under the microscope. We can show you an aphid with eight eyeballs and five fangs, and they're scary looking. And there's hundreds of them. So we can show you that as you see it. Don't let things go this time of year. Everything is growing really fast right now. Your plants are growing. That's why it's such a good time to plant. Things grow really, they root really fast. But your insects grow really fast. The shrubs grow really fast. Everything grows faster now. It's like you're in a greenhouse effect. It's because of humidity. It's just this perfect growing environment. It's, it's, it's a good time to plant. So if you get on those things, if you let it go even a week, literally we can watch spider mites erupt within two hours. It, it can go from, I don't see anything, to it's covered like that. So it goes fast. So blister beetles, there's a, a swarm of beetles that comes, and they'll, they'll eat not so much fruit trees. They really like ash trees, desert willows, brooms, certain things. They'll light, and they'll literally strip the plant clean. So you don't want to be ready for those things. The thing I can tell you right now, what we're using a lot of, I just sprayed this on my yard. This is Sayonara. 
sayonara, it's goodbye to bugs. If you hit it, it will die. Uh, it's the least offensive chemical spray you can have. So this is a, they replicated mums. There's a, a pyrethrum and permethrin. They're kind of the same. One's natural, one's a copy of the natural. That's what this is. So it's a seafood, but it lasts longer. It'll stay in the tree a little bit longer. Has a better kill factor. Than the, than the native one, so we sell this. So this is this, grasshoppers, blister beetles, aphids, uh, a coddling moth, I've heard that a couple times. That's the worm that gets in uh, apples and pears. It would do that, so. Um, uh, generally, the, the, those kinds of things, it'll, it can if you hit them over the head with the bottle, but <laughs> usually it's okay. So that's one to spray in the morning when the birds aren't out as much. Uh, it's less windy. In, in the morning, so it's, there's times, there's a better time to do it than others. So that's one we can help you as you see things. With that, I got to release because we're getting antsy. We're an hour and 15 into this. Thanks for coming. Next week, hey, Ken, what's next week's class on? Oh, gardening for new, that'll be, that'll be every chair out. It'll be, it'll be packed. So it'll be, everyone will be out. So gardening for newcomers. Well, it's pretty technical class. That's a frost, frost dates, zones. We'll have a lot of manuals on that one. So it'll be kind of up your game on here's the baseline of where you want to start gardening. That'll be next week. But before you go, yeah. A couple of people asked about last week's class. Yeah. Perennials. Yes. I just wanted to be sure everybody understood it. We were planning to be here and couldn't make it. It's available on our YouTube channel. Oh, great. That's good. Let me, let me re, let me re quote that just for the folks on camera because they couldn't hear it with the microphone. So if you miss a class, like last year's was perennials, it was another packed class or same room only. It was all the, all the uh, flowers, perennial flowers, things that come back. If you miss a class or if you missed a note, you want to go back and see it, we will have this on our YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube Waters Garden Center, there's literally thousands of, of classes on there. We've been doing this for, for decades. You can go back. It'll be at the top of the feed. You can go back and watch that. So please take advantage of that. With that, before you go, the old actor in me says, thank you very much. You can clap for me. That just makes me, makes me feel better.